Why is conflict so important? Because it leads to real commitment. See, if the team doesn't have conflict and it makes a decision, but nobody really weighed in honestly, you can have very little confidence that there's actual true commitment. The, the company um, um, Intel, they used to have this great the culture where they said disagree and commit. Go into meetings and, and be, and they would be brutal with each other. It was kind of a sport, like, you're an idiot, that's a dumb idea. And then after the meeting, they go, okay, so what's the decision? All right, we're going out together. So it was, they, they prepped them for that. The idea is, though, it's, it would be, it's better to have conflict that leads to real commitment than it is to go, hey, let's not talk about this, and then I will just make the decision as a leader. Because when the leader makes the decision and avoids the team having any conflict, which is very tempting because like, hey, listen, I don't want them to disagree. I don't want them to have any conflict. I'll just make the decision. Are they going to actively commit to that decision? No. You know what they're going to do? They're going to nod their heads and smile. Then they're going to go back to their teams and they're going to go, I don't know if this is a good idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then they're going to, then they're going to alligator arm that decision. Oh, let me help with that. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> they're not going to really dive in and help. If you want commitment, the kind of commitment that comes from people who are like, I am totally in with you. You have to entertain conflict. And you know something? Even if at the end of that conflict, they don't agree. Even at the end of that conflict, Terry says, I still don't know if this is the right decision. And you have to say as a leader, I know it, but I've listened to you all and I get your opinion, Carrie, and maybe you're right. But here's the deal. We've talked about this and I'm the leader and I have to break this tie and I need your support. Do you know 99 times out of 100, Carrie will support that decision because she knows that her input was heard. She knows it was factored in and it can be explained. People don't need to have their way. I mean, how many people are here like, if I don't get my way, I can't support a decision. None of us are like that unless it's unethical or immoral. But most times, as long as we know we've been heard and we understand the, the, the process that the leader went through to make the decision, we'll support it. When we don't have conflict, we make it impossible for people to truly commit. Conflict is that, is that important for commitment. Now, commitment is important. Why do I need to know that all these people truly bought in? You know why? Because at some point, they're going to have to do something that if they don't think they've committed, they're never going to do it, and it's hold each other accountable. Henry talked about accountability. Definitely not a negative thing. Accountability is a wonderful thing. Okay, we've made the, what did he say? It's an account. It's in a contract we made, right? And, and we made an agreement that this is what we're going to have to do. We committed to it. Now, somebody, everybody at some point is going to do something that's not quite on plan, either knowingly or unknowingly. You need to have the confidence to hold one another accountable when you see somebody go off plan to say, hey, hey, um, Cecil, you got to do a better job at this because this isn't what we agreed to, you know, but is Rebecca going to do that if she doesn't think Cecil committed to that decision? No. See, the strongest form, by the way, notice I didn't say, am I as the leader going to hold Cecil accountable? I said, is Rebecca, his colleague, going to hold him accountable? The, the, the most powerful source of accountability on a team is not the leader. The primary source of accountability on a team is not the leader, it's their team member. Peer-to-peer -peer accountability is far more effective, far more powerful than leader to, to subordinate. The best teams in the world, look in the military, look in police, look in sports, look in the best companies, they don't wait for the leader, the boss. They don't go, hey boss, I don't, don't. Cecil did something here and, uh, and don't tell him I told you, but you gotta, and then the leader's like, oh great, Cecil, I did. who told you? Ah, oh, it doesn't matter, now it's politics. Rebecca turns to Cecil and says, hey Cecil, you gotta do better on this. That is so effective. And if you're a leader and you're sitting here thinking, wow, this is fantastic. I don't have to be the primary source of accountability anymore. Pat, how do I get my teammates to start doing that? Here's the thing. You have to prove to them that you're willing to do it. Because see, while you not, should not be the primary source of accountability on a team, you are the ultimate source. They have to know that when push comes to shove, you are going to do that. Okay? Now, the leader has to be the source of accountability and say, you've got to quit doing that. Once it happened to me, I worked directly for the, the CEO of a company before I started mine, and I was in charge of leadership development and communication. So I had my annual budget review with the CFO. All the CFOs in the room, raise your hand. Yeah, oh, just like you. Look like a grumpy, curmudgeon guy like you. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, so I went and, and I, I brought my binder to work with the CFO. And, I, and he said, before we get into the numbers, Pat, I, I, I just want you to know, if it, if it were up to me, I'd fire you and your, and your department, the people in your department, because I think the stuff you do is silly. 
but since I'm from California, I thanked him for sharing, you know, I thank you for sharing. <laughs> and I said, Fred, here's the deal. Your next door neighbor in this 5,000 person company is the CEO, okay? You need to go talk to him and tell him why you think my programs are stupid and put me out of my misery or else let him talk you into it and get on board. He goes, I'm not gonna do that. I said, I will. Next day I knocked on the CEO's door. I said, Mark, Fred hates this stuff that I'm doing for you. He doesn't wanna fund it. He thinks it's, he doesn't send his people to it. You need to talk to him. The CEO said, oh, that's just how Fred is. And I was like, well, not everybody knows Fred. It doesn't matter. It still makes the programs look bad. It hurts the executive team. You just got to talk to me. He said, Pat, I don't have time. I got Wall Street issues. I got angry customers. I got lawsuits to deal with. Now, what do you notice about that example and the last one? Neither of them said, I don't have the time or the energy to hold someone accountable for missing their numbers four quarters in a row. Even the wussiest of us leaders will do that. Objective accountability for a number, that's not hard. The kind of accountability I'm talking about that comes first is behavioral accountability. When you see a behavior that is going to threaten the performance of the team, you have to enter the danger as a leader and say, this just isn't gonna work. I need to help you with this. So many leaders would rather wait till the numbers came in so they can say, well, I like you and all, but it's, you're just not doing it. And yet they saw two quarters earlier the behavior that was leading to that. If you're a great leader, you have to be willing to say to somebody, hey, come here after the meeting. You know something, Brian? You're, you, you talk too much during the meeting and nobody else gets a word in. And it hurts your credibility and it, we're not listening. We're not hearing from you. I need you to change that. Or you know something, um, David? I was at that presentation with a customer and the truth is that you didn't have enough discipline. I need you to prepare better. It sets a bad example and, you're, and it's not the way we want to come show up. And then you might as well throw up and say, and you, Dennis, you have bad breath. The trifecta, you know what I mean? It's like, get them all in there. The greatest leaders do these things. And the L word, I'll use it, it's because they love the people that work for them. Because when you don't tell somebody things like these things, that's not love. I used to justify my lack of accountability, think I cared so much about my people, I didn't want them to feel bad. One day I realized, I just don't want them to blame me for feeling bad. Because ultimately it's gonna show up on a performance review or they're gonna get let go. And they're not gonna come back and say, hey Pat, thanks for not confronting me. I got fired, but you really made that day good for me. You know, we have to confront people about behaviors. We have to be humble enough to do it. If they go, oh, you don't understand. This is what I go, oh, I guess I didn't see it correctly. I'm sorry, I just want to. That's still better that they know you cared enough to put it out there. This behavioral accountability is the lowest score on our, on our, on our assessment. It's really hard for people to do this. And yet when you break through the barrier of accountability, and Henry talked about it too, it's such a wonderful thing. It's an act of love. It's not punishment. Accountability is huge.